Hello, everybody. This is Jason Hill with Word of Promise Ministries. Thank you so much for joining us today as we are in this big series where we're talking about the church. And when we say the church again, we're not talking about the building, but we're talking about the people of God, those that have come to faith in Jesus Christ and have trusted in him. They are called the church, the body of Christ. And in this uh, big series on the church, we're talking about so many different aspects of the church. And one aspect that we are focused on right now is specifically talking about maturing in Christ, the maturity of the church, the development of the, tr the church, the growing up of the church. And this foundation scripture that we have had for this particular subject is over here in first Corinthians chapter three, starting at verse one, where it says, and I brethren could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. He says, I fed you with milk and not with solid food for until now you are not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able. He says, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and division among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? And so we've used this as a foundation scripture because it shows this two grouping of Christians. These are Christians that he is speaking to and of here. And he says, and I, brethren, cannot speak to you as to spiritual people. He's speaking to believers. People that have come to faith in Jesus Christ, people that are saved, but he said he couldn't speak to them as, as to spiritual people, but as to carnal. And then he clarifies that carnal, he says, as to babes in Christ. So he shows again that this uh, uh, term of babe in Christ speaks of someone that would be immature, someone that is new to the faith. And that's what he said. He had to speak to these people as if they were new to the faith, as if they were babes in Christ, instead of being spiritual people, which again would represent a more developed, mature person in Christ. And so we have gone on to show these two grouping of individuals, the mature and the immature. And what we talked about were some of the attributes of the immature Christian. And we said, number one, that scripture showed was that they are carnal or of the flesh. And we said that this means that they live based on a focus upon themselves. This is, again, an attribute of a beginner in Christ. When a person initially comes to Christ Jesus, pretty much all they know is Jesus died for my sins. And so they still pretty much live and function the way that they did before. They're still self-dependent, still operating according to themselves. Even if it was to attempt to do what they thought God wanted them to do, they were still focused on themselves. Well, that means they're carnal. They're of the flesh. We said B is that they don't hold fast to Jesus as the head because, again, they live upon with this focus on themselves. They don't cling to Jesus. They don't look to him as their source, as their everything that they need. They still are self-dependent. They're still trying in and of themselves to please God and to to uh, and even in some cases trying to uh, maintain their right standing with God through their own goodness. That's a picture of them clinging and focused on themselves instead of Jesus, instead of clinging to Jesus Christ. We said C is that they don't grow with the increase that is from God. And again, it's the picture of, again, a a branch clinging to a vine. That branch will have all the nutrients that it needs, everything that it needs in order for it to grow and to, to move and be what it is called to be is going to be the result of it clinging to the vine. It's not going to be the result of it determining within itself that it's going to stop this. It's going to produce this. It's going to be this. It does and is all of that as a result of it clinging to the vine. Well, that vine we read in John 15 is Jesus. He's the head. He's the source. And again, a immature Christian hasn't been brought to the place yet where they cling solely 
to Jesus. They look exclusively to him. And just like in that example Jesus gave in John 15, where he says that they will produce fruit, the one who abides in him. Well, again, it's the same thing. He's showing us as far as us clinging to the head. We will then operate and function differently. And that's the next thing that we learn is the fact that the immature Christian, the carnal Christian, the one that still lives according to himself is going to behave in the same way that unsaved mankind behaves. And we said that that A means that their behavior is the result of them living according to the flesh. Again, again, that is a result of them uh, living and operating according to their own self-will, their own self-purposes, their own self-ability, their strength, their power to do whatever it is they believe needs to be done. Again, they are self-focused and they live according to the flesh. And so just like the world has behavior that is a byproduct of them living according to the flesh, this believer, although he is uh, attached to Jesus, he's a part of the body of Christ. He still will, again, function the same way that the world does, because, again, he doesn't cling to Jesus as his head, as a, again, an immature Christian. We said, B, their behavior is the byproduct of them having a focus upon themselves. Again, I hope you all see the, the connection of, of all of this and, and what the root of all of this is that it's all rooted in themselves again because they focused on what my purposes are what my goals are what i have to try to do for god what i have to try to be how i have to try to be better all of these are mentalities that we had prior to christ and when a person comes to faith in christ that doesn't just automatically change overnight and so an immature christian still has Again, this focus upon themselves. And again, it ultimately affects their behavior. Their behavior is going to be a byproduct of that. Because again, and as we have shown and have shown, that the Spirit of God doesn't work in a person's life when they have that focus, when that's the direction that they're operating in. We said, see, their behavior is the result of the fulfilling of the desires of the flesh and we said again the desires of the flesh are what we would call in the world uh, again feelings and emotions again that are ultimately of self and we said again that that's in ephesians chapter 2 that again people's behavior in every capacity is an attempt to fulfill some desire that's working on the inside of them some feeling some emotion is what is behind everything that everybody does. Well, the person who still lives according to the flesh and their focus is on the things of self, the things of the flesh, again, the desire, the emotions, the feelings that are going to be formed in them are going to be desires of self, desires of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, feelings and emotions that are of self. That is what is going to be formed on the inside of us. And that is what is going to govern our behavior, whether we want the outcome or not. Whether we want the outcome that that desire leads to or not doesn't matter. What, de what matters is how I function. Do I live according to the flesh, according to self? Is my focus there? Well, if it is, then the desires of the flesh are what's going to be formed on the inside of me. And it's going to affect my behavior, whether I want it to or not. Again, that is an attribute of that immature Christian who still lives according to the flesh, according to themselves. That's where their focus is. Even if in self, they want to do good for God. That doesn't matter. What matters is the direction of your heart. And we'll talk more about that. But then three, we said that the immature Christian is not able to eat solid food. And that solid food is the food of the word. And again, it shows that picture of when you have a baby, what do, do they initially eat on? They eat on milk or they drink milk. That's all they can handle in the beginning. They can't handle uh, uh, solid food. And so we said that that means A, that they are are not able to retain the basic 
principles of Christ. That's the milk of the word, the bottom base root of what it is that Jesus did for you and how it's all about him, how it's all about what he's accomplished, how it's all about what he made available and not about you at all. That's the milk that a person is supposed to partake in and eat on before they can get to the place of solid food where an immature Christian again is supposed to feed on that they're supposed to feed on and again when I say immature Christian a babe in Christ or not just a babe in Christ but even a person again because what we're going to see what we've seen is the fact that a person is, isn't a babe in Christ just because they're newly into Christ they can be uh, uh, what you would call if we think about it in the terms of uh, nowadays when you have a, a child that's a person that's 20 years old, but they have the mind of a child and that you would say that there's some type of retardation there. Again, they are immature. Again, that is a picture as well of some Christians who have been saved 5, 10, 15 years and again, and still operate and function in immaturity. Again, they as well need to partake of the milk and they can't handle the solid food as well and then we said b again that they are not able this immature christian is not able to repent from dead self-focused works to now trust in what god can do in their lives again again that's again what some of that solid food is and that milk is supposed to bring a person to it's supposed to bring a person to a place where they are fed so much with christ and what he's done what he's made available and it's all about him that now their heart starts to be turned away from themselves they're repenting from their self-focused dead works useless works to now, it says, serve the living God. To now, receive and operate in what God has provided for them. Well, again, the immature Christian that is fixed in that direction, that won't even allow the milk of the word to really work in them, won't be turned away from their dead self-focused works to now receive what God and trust in him for what he said he can do. They've trusted in him for salvation, for right standing. Thank God that they have done that. When, But now when it's talking about what God can do in their lives and how he can do it, again, they can't, they, they, they can't receive and walk in that because they're not even turned away from it being about themselves yet. They're still focused on themselves. And then C, we said, they are not able to receive what God is planning. I hope y'all see the whole motion of this whole thing. Again, I'm focused on myself. If I'm constantly hearing what it is that Christ has done, then I will turn away from all these things I was trying to do to be accepted, to be received, to be righteous, to now turn to the Lord and receive what he is wanting to do in me and what he has planned for me. Well, the one who is still fixed over in this direction, still consumed with themselves, they won't be turned in that place. They will stay in that place of immaturity. A person, of course, that continues to be fed with the milk of the word, they will be again turned away from that dead self-focused works to now serve the living God, to look to him. And so we said that's some of the attributes of an immature Christian. We said attributes of a mature Christian are the fact that they are number one, spiritual, or they operate of the spirit, they're of the spirit. And we said that that means A, they walk and are led by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God has been sent to this earth for a particular purpose. And again, the spiritual Christian is the one who walks according to that purpose that the Spirit of God is there to do. What he is called to do, they are allowing him to do that in their lives. And what we said and what we saw over in John 16 is the purpose of the Spirit of God is to take what Jesus has done, what he's accomplished, and declare it to us so that we can live and function and be led according to that truth. And that's, number, that's B as well, is the fact that these spiritual uh, Christians 
allow the truth of Christ to be imparted into their hearts in order to shape their focus, thinking, and mindset. That's what a spiritual Christian, like a mature Christian does. They allow the truth of who Christ is to affect their mindset, their thinking, to, to where now their thinking is all about what Christ has done in every aspect when they start to see things of the world, see things of people, see things of God. They see them through the lens of what Christ has done, what he's provided. That's another attribute of a mature Christian. And we said, see, they grow and are changed by the work of the spirit uh, of God in their hearts. And uh, as they behold the glory of Christ, that mature Christian is the one whose heart is fixed in the direction of Christ. They look to Christ and that is when the spirit of God can do the work in their lives to change them, to renew them, to empower them, to keep them, to lead them, to do everything he wants to do as far as his transformative work on the inside of them. And that actually is the next thing that we have is number two, their behavior is different from the world. The mature Christian is different from the world and how they live. Just like we said, the immature Christian, they function the same way that the world does. And therefore, their behavior is the same way where the mature Christian's behavior is different, not because they determine within themselves to live right to get it together. I'm going to live holy. And all these things that people say, no, they again are transformed by the spirit of God to live differently. And we said, A, their behavior is a byproduct of the transformative work of the spirit in their lives. It is not their self-will, it's not their power, not their strength, not their determination to be different, but because the Spirit of God is doing this great work in their lives. And why is he doing that? Because their heart is are turned toward the Lord Jesus Christ, not because they determined to be better and get it together. B, we said their behavior is a byproduct of the power and life of God imparted into them by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God does that, release the life and power of God on the inside of them, and that's what causes their behavior to be different. C, their behavior is a byproduct of the character of Christ slash fruit of the Spirit formed in them. And D, their behavior is the byproduct of the change that the Holy Spirit brings when their hearts are by faith turned to look to Christ. Again, that's what makes their behavior different, not their determination to say, I'm going to stop doing this and get this together. It is a result of the Spirit of God doing his work. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. He does this work on the inside of them when their hearts are turned to behold the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we said, lastly, they are able to eat solid food. We said, A, they are able first to retain the basic principles of Christ. First off, they're able to allow everything that, that Jesus Christ has done uh, and what he's accomplished to be imparted into their hearts, to turn them away from their self-focused works to now look to Jesus and look to what he's done. They allow that milk of the word to be imparted. B, they are able to handle the why of what God has done through Christ and how it will impact their lives. The how and the why of what God did, his wisdom and everything that he did, they again are able to understand that because again, they know it's all about Christ and so they can understand the hows of why he sent Christ and the why of why he sent Christ. See, they are able to discern God's way and plan versus Satan's through use of the solid food. They're able to understand, again, the difference between Satan's way, although it may seem good, is still of self, versus God's way, which makes it all about Christ. And C and D, they are kept from being swayed by the lies that men teach to deceive believers in Christ. The lies are always connected to self in some kind of way. And so they're able to discern the difference. And so when we return, what we're going to look at now is then what causes 
of Christians to mature? What causes them to go from this place of being immature to mature? We already said that the catalyst is humility, but when we come back, we're going to look at what else is there to bring that to pass. I'll see you in a second. All right, we are back. And what we left off is we left off asking the question, what causes Christians to mature? What causes them to go from this place of being an immature Christian to a mature Christian? And we already talked about how humility is a catalyst. An immature Christian, because they still live according to themselves, they still function according to the flesh they operate and their behavior is on the byproduct of the flesh because they live according to themselves well again as they do that that should be a brokenness a humility a, 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 a contrite spirit that is working in them because of the direction that they are they're going to experience the guilt the condemnation that comes from the result of you living and functioning that way. And as they do that, that humility is gonna open up their hearts for something else to take place that's gonna aid in their maturity. So let's look at this scripture over here in Ephesians chapter four, starting at verse seven uh, to help us see this. Look what he says, he says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. That word gifts is nothing more than something that is given freely or given by grace. Again, he gave gifts to men. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he gave gifts to men. And that's what Paul is talking about to each one of us. Grace, a gift was given it says in verse 9 now this he ascended what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth he who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens that he might feel all things and then in verse 11 and he himself gave some gave some what gave some great gifts gave grace gave something to them that was freely given, not earned, not deserved. He says to be apostles. So there were gifts given. There was a grace given by Jesus as he was raised from the dead to apostles, to, uh, to, to uh, excuse me, to people so that they could be apostles, so that they could be prophets, so that they could be evangelists and some pastors and teachers now look at what this gift given to them so that they could function this way look at what the purpose of it was it says for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of god to a perfect man to a mature man remember we said that, that that word perfect there is speaking of a mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ so catch that again now he gave gifts to individuals so that they could be apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers so that as they function as that they can then equip the saints uh, for the work of the ministry, they could edify or build up the body of Christ and until until they can do this till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to this mature man in Christ. So he gave them gifts for that purpose so that they can do something in order to aid in people coming to this mature place in Christ. So let's keep on reading. Verse 14, he says that we should no longer be children. Notice again, the mature man, perfect man versus the child. He says again, so that we no longer be that child that is tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. He says, but speaking the truth in love may, be, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. 
from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself. So that this body can edify and build up itself. God, oh goodness, Jesus gave gifts for these individuals so that he could, they, these individuals by that gift could equip in other individuals, edify them, build them up, bring them to this place of maturity where they're no longer tossed to and fro with all these false doctrines that folks keep on coming up with, but instead they are speaking the truth in love that is causing people to grow up. And as those individuals grow up, they can speak the truth in love that will cause others to grow up. And it's this perpetual edifying of itself that the body of Christ is operating in. And they are doing so because they are gifted to be something. And as they do that, they are speaking the truth in love. So that he shows us here is what is going to cause the edifying and the building up and the maturity of the people of God is them having the truth spoken to them in love. And so what then is that truth that is going to cause this maturity within the church? What is the truth that is to be spoken in love? Well, let's look at some scriptures that show what it was that these grouping of individuals that he said he gave gifts to actually did. Let's look and see what they did. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 10, where it says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, if you notice that same thing he's saying again, just like Jesus raised from the dead, he gave gifts to men, he gave grace to each one of us. Paul is here saying the same thing. He says, according to this grace that was given to me, as a wise master builder, I laid the foundation and another build on it, builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. He shows this two grouping of people, one people, group of people where he says they lay the foundation. Another builds on top of that foundation. And so he goes on to say, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Paul says here. By the grace of God that was given to me, I have laid the foundation. And what is the foundation? The foundation is Christ. Meaning what? I came in presenting to people what it was that Jesus Christ did and accomplished and provided for them. I'm the, I'm the one who was given grace by God to do that. And let's go ahead and look at another scripture that connects with that same scripture over here in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 19. It says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Catch this, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets jesus christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fit together grows notice that again that maturity into a holy temple that's the edifying of the church in the lord and so notice what i'm, I'm pointing out here he says here that the foundation uh, um uh, that they were built on was of the apostles and prophets. Now, remember what we read in Ephesians chapter four, later on in the same chapter, in the same book, he says here that again, God gave gifts to be apostles and be prophets. Okay. What then does it show us here that they are the ones who laid the foundation they are the ones that Paul and those that walk with him are the ones that went out and laid the foundation that the people of God are called to stand on. That people, again, stand on what Jesus Christ has done, what he's accomplished, what he's provided. And it shows us here that Jesus himself is the chief cornerstone. If you understand what a cornerstone is, uh, when there's a blueprint of a building or, or, or of a structure, you have the chief cornerstone that everything is to be measured and, and, and everything uh, is to be measured and determined by 
uh, that chief cornerstone. Everything, its placement, everywhere it goes is all to be determined by that first chief cornerstone. And that's a picture of what Jesus actually did before Paul and them can go out and preach and proclaim this wonderful truth of what he did. He actually had to do it. He had to go out and accomplish this work. He had to go out and actually die and be buried and be raised from the dead. He had to live the perfect life and be the sacrifice for us. That's him being that chief cornerstone. And then Paul says the apostles and prophets lay the foundation from that chief cornerstone by going out and presenting to people what it was that he did. That's them laying the foundation. That's when he says he gave gifts to men. Again, he gave gifts to Paul and, and to others in order to lay that foundation. And even this day, and we're going to talk about that eventually. I believe that there are apostles this day that lay that same foundation. And again, that churches that are truly of Christ are built on that foundation. But we'll get into that later. But again, these apostles and prophets lay that foundation, which is what the Christ. And this is where I'm trying to get it to get us to understand is Christ. The foundation is Christ. So it is them speaking the truth in love, which is what the truth of what Christ has done for them out of God's love for us. And what he did in sending Jesus to do, accomplish what he accomplished for us, the apostles and prophets laid that foundation so that people can stand on and be built on that foundation. So I said this, I said mature, I said uh, when we ask the question of what causes Christian maturity, I said maturing in Christ starts with the work that Jesus accomplished through his death, burial and resurrection. It starts there first. Jesus had to accomplish and do what he did. I said, number two, maturing in Christ continues with the that work of Christ being laid by the apostles and prophets as the foundation that all believers in Christ can stand on. That is the, the what any true believer in Christ stands on is what Christ has done. And, and the apostles and prophets proclaim that wonderful good news of Christ. Okay, so that is the foundation that people are, have to be built up on. It can't be the psychology of the world, the thinking of the world, the understanding of the world, uh, 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 all of the philosophies of the world. None of that is what a person is going to stand on and be matured. From God's standpoint of what maturity is, it has to be on the foundation of what Christ has done and that proclaimed to them, that good news of what he did proclaimed to him. So let's then look at some other things that show exactly what it is that causes maturity. Look at Colossians chapter one, verse 27. It says, to them, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And this is the part here that I want to pull out. Verse 28, him, meaning what? Christ, Jesus, him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect. Again, that's that word mature. So that we can present every man mature in Christ. Again, we do what? We preach him. Warning every man and teaching every man. What though? In all wisdom that we may present every man uh, 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 mature or perfect in Christ. To this end, I also, look what he says. I labor striving according to his working in me. This is not, again, according to my own will, my own thinking, my own power. But it is a grace that is given in order for people to be again, an individual who can truly preach Christ and preach him uh, alone again. So what is uh, my point here when he shows us here that him we preach, we warn every man 
and we teach every man in all wisdom. Again, what is that? That's the picture of, again, a part of that fivefold that we looked at. We already talked about apostles. We already talked about prophets. What was left? Evangelists, pastors, and teachers. What does evangelists do? They go out warning every man. How do they do it? By preaching Jesus. By proclaiming to the people Jesus and what it is that he's done. And what does a pastor and teacher do? They are those that after now the apostles and prophets have laid the foundation of the church. They would then be over the church to edify and build up the people of the church. That's what when we read back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 where he said one person uh, uh, lays the foundation. Another one builds on top. Of that foundation that's a picture of what pastors and teachers do and how do they do that they teach and preach in all wisdom what Jesus did what he accomplished how it's going to affect your life how it's going to impact you what it means for your relationship with God what it means for that struggle that bondage that you have what Jesus did uh, and how it affects you and how it will uh, uh, um, lead to a new and different life that's what a pastor and teacher does and they are given a gift uh, in order to do that. But what is my point with this? My point is what is it that they preach and teach? Jesus. They preach and teach Jesus. And if you notice, there are multiple scriptures that constantly talking about that talk about preaching and teaching of Jesus. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. It says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, Paul says, but to preach the gospel. What's the gospel? The good news of what Jesus did through his death, burial, and resurrection. He says, Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. In verse 23 it says, But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness and then in first Corinthians chapter 2 verse 1 and 2 it says and I brethren this is Paul when I came to you did not come with excellent excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus and him crucified. That's all I got for you. That's why anytime I go anywhere and I preach, I tell people I ain't got nothing for you other than Jesus because that's the only thing that God is going to grace people to minister that is going to cause those that hear to ed be edified and to be developed and to be matured. And so I said this, number three, when we ask the question of what causes Christian maturity, we said maturing in Christ continues with the work of Christ and its effects in people's lives, lives being proclaimed and taught to believers. People out there need to hear, and I'm talking about saved people that go to church every day, need to hear Jesus. They need to have preached to them Jesus, not this fluff. That people are presenting and talking and filling up churches with this stuff. That people are saved, but they're not edified. They're carnal. They're, they're again, uh, defaming Christianity, again, because they're not being mature. And so, again, the question then that we ask, okay, we know that people are going to, are needing to have Christ preached to them in order to mature, but what does that go, what is that going to do? And we said over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 through 6, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, catch this, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. He says, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus. And I just want to pause there again. He said what this gospel, this light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. He says that is what we preach. He calls it a light. A light that, again, is shining. He says that Satan does not want it to shine on people. Again, he's saying that they, he doesn't want, Satan doesn't want the gospel 
to hit people's ears, to have them hear what it is that Christ has done. And so he attempts to put a veil over people's eyes. But look what he says. He says, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your bond servants for Jesus sakes. For it is God who commanded, who, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to do what? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What is he talking about here? He's saying that that light of the gospel that we go forth and we proclaim that we preach to others, it is a light that now will shine down on them, just like the sun shines down and beams down on us. And he says that as that light shines down on people, what do they do? That light is the good news of what Jesus has done. And so when that happens, their hearts are turned to face Jesus, to look to him, to trust in him, depend upon him. And this is what a place that uh, um, believers are brought to. They're not just automatically there because they got saved. As they consistently hear all of what Jesus has done and what he's accomplished, their hearts are turned toward Jesus to look to him and that light is shining down. And so what then is the result of that light? shining down that light of the glory of Christ shining down on them we'll go back to the previous chapter in 2 Corinthians at chapter 3 verse 18 and look what he says here he says but we all with unveiled face that's that veil that Satan again we talked about later on in verse in chapter 4 uh, that, that is removed he says what do we do we are beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. What is this scripture talking about? When he says here, this glory of the Lord is again, uh, uh, we behold as in a mirror. He gives this picture of just like if you take a big mirror outside and you face it toward the sun, the light from the sun is going to shine down into that mirror. And what is it going to do? It's going to heat up that mirror and at the same time that light uh, from that was shining into that mirror is going to reflect out of that mirror that mirror is going to be turned into a reflection of the sun it's going to turn into the same image of the sun well again that because that's what happened when he says that's where our hearts are when our hearts are turned toward the lord jesus christ because that light of the glory of Christ is poured down into our hearts, what happens? The spirit of God begins to transform us and make us image bearers of Jesus Christ. Well, we begin, begin to mature and be different people. And that's ultimately why it is so important that we have Christ and him alone preach to us and proclaim to us. So number four, I said this, what causes Christian maturity? Number four, the maturing process of the believer comes to pass by the spirit of God as the believer's heart is turned to the Lord to behold the glory of all that he accomplished for them through his death, burial, and resurrection. And that's ultimately, again, the difference between an immature Christian and a mature Christian. A mature Christian is simply one who has his heart turned toward the Lord. The immature is the one who still is consumed with his self-will, his self-purposes, his power, his strength. And what aids in him getting to the place of maturity is first humility and brokenness because of what he is experiencing by him living according to his way. And then secondly, him having Christ preached to him. And this is why it is so important and it burns my heart when I see so many Christians out there that go to churches that don't preach Christ, that don't preach the truth, that give them hyperbole and hype and fluff and nothing that is going to edify them, but they amen it, they swear by it, they think that they're growing and they just as carnal as they can be. 
and they don't know uh, the truth of what Christ has done and what he's wanted to do on the inside of them because they're satisfied with the self-focused words that are preached to them. But God says in order for maturity to truly take place, he's saying that we need to have Christ and him alone preached to us. Again, he is enough. And it's a picture of uh, back in the Old Testament when the children of Israel got tired of the, the uh, what was it, uh, that they were being fed. Uh, 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 that was a picture of Christ. Oh, Lord, I can't think of the, the word. But they were constantly being fed something and they got tired of it. And they said, I want the garlic and the leeks that we used to have when we were in Egypt. Well, that is a type and shadow of what happens to believers. They get tired of uh, hearing about Jesus. I want to hear about how I can get money, how I can be a baller, how I can, how I can live my best life, how I can improve in this career, how I can be this business person and, and be all of this. And, and again, and none of that means absolutely anything. The only thing that God wants is for you to hear Christ and he knows that you'll be led by his spirit to do and function as God has called you to function when that happens. And so as we continue on, I think we'll probably do a recap of talking about maturity, maturing in Christ as we continue uh, to get ready for the next portion of the series that we're going to talk about regarding the church. But I think we're going to do a couple of maybe recaps of all of what we've talked about so far and then move on. God bless you guys. I hope you're being edified by this. And I pray that through this lesson, if anything else, you ain't heard anything else, just hear you need to hear Jesus, nothing else. You need to have preached to you Jesus. You need to really learn what it is that he's done and he's accomplished and he's provided for you and how it will affect your life so that your mindset, your thinking, yeah, everything can now be determined by what, by what he's done and now he can begin to do this work in your life by his spirit. God bless you guys. I will see you next time.